Victims, so much about this, excuse me, victims of racial policies in 32, they were victims of misinformation, shooting suspicions of a science. We, we must do better than that. I want to take it publicly to say those who come to me, uh, John Davis and Maxine Waters, a number of us have taken the shot, you get vaccinated because it, it, it has a major remedy in it. We're guaranteed to catch this disease unless we back take proper scientific disciplines. Number one, wearing the mask and distancing and hand sanitation. There are four weapons against this disease. Number one, masking. Masking matters. See, masking matters. Social distancing, not congregating in crowds, and hand sanitation. Another vaccine. I'm taking my second vaccine in the appropriate time. People all, all around the country to not fear the vaccine, fear not having it. Hope in the work. Take the vaccination. Take the vaccination. Take the vaccination. Now. Now. Keep hope. Keep hope. Alive. Alive. Keep hope. Keep hope. Alive. Alive. Hi, everybody. I'm Santita Jackson. Welcome to this special edition of the Rainbow Push Coalition. And let's talk about it with Santita Jackson and friends. Conversation tonight. What are we talking about? COVID 19. We're going to have a candid, COVID conversation because we need to, and we're gonna have this conversation with some of the most trusted persons in the field of health. How did we get here in the United States? In the United States, we're only four, four and a half percent of the world. And yet we're one quarter, a little more than one quarter of the world's COVID-19 cases. Let me give you, let me set the table for you. It's 107 million cases of COVID-19 all around the world. 27 million are in the United States. More than 400,000 persons have died. How did we get here and how could we navigate our way to healthfulness? Well, we've got a tremendous panel with us tonight who are going to help us to break it all down. And if you don't mind, I'm going to put the ladies first. We are so excited to have Dr. Shanina Knighton. Here's Dr. Shanina Knighton. She is a registered nurse who is who has a doctorate in her field. And she wants to talk to you tonight about how we can prevent infection and spread. We've got Dr. Deborah Furholzen. She's one of the world's leading epidemiologists. She's an associate dean of public health at Michigan State University. And of course, Dr. Ivan Walks, former head of the DC Office of Public Health. And then of course, the man who's helping to lead it all for us, the head of the National Medical Association. This is the largest organization of Black physicians in the world. Dr. Leon McDougall, who's from The Ohio State University. Let us begin and let us start 
Dr. Knighton. You know, uh, nurses are the unsung heroes, if you will, in the medical profession. They're the ones when we're in the hospital, they sit with us for a long, long, long time. It's not that we don't love our doctors, but we do love our nurses. And we're very, very excited to have this young woman because she has a doctorate in the in the space. And she wants to talk to us about the infection of COVID-19, how we spread it, um, how we catch it, how we spread it. It seems to me, Dr. Knighton, a year in, I see a lot of people who uh, use their masks sparingly, and if you will, to come up with another word, erringly. They wear it on their chins, they come into a building, Dr. Walks and Dr. McDougal, and they pull it down and and then they see you because they know you, they they take their masks off in the car. It's like, oh my gosh, how is this spread? Is this airborne? What what are we looking at with the coronavirus and COVID-19, Dr. Knight? So for one, it's not something way anytime soon. And I'm sure um, our other panelists can allude to that. And unfortunately, there's this false sense of perception that as we continue to seek treatments, um, different vaccines, different solutions, that there's going to be this one size fits all. And so just as you alluded to, you know, going inside of a building, watching people use masks correctly and incorrectly, knowing that only three to six percent of the population cleans their hands correctly, you really do wonder, is it a matter of the government doing everything that they need to do? Is it a matter of people just not doing what they need to do? And so what I'm concerned about right now is, is now that we know what we should do, I'm not seeing enough com campaigns or information about how to do it. So many people aren't aware of how to even wear a correct, how, how to wear a mask correctly. And so there's individuals, let's say they're wearing it beneath their chin, you have others that are deciding, you know what, I'm just going to have it beneath my nose. Yeah. And so we're still exposing areas and many are missing why we're wearing them to begin with. And the assumption is, is that because we know that people are either asymptomatic, meaning that they may show no symptoms, or individuals may think they have an allergy cough and it can be something that's more severe. Um, we run into a situation of where they don't recognize that the assumption is that we are all sick and that we want to keep our germs to ourselves to, to prevent it from being spread to others. And so there's a lot of practices that I think are lack in regards to seeing individuals and how they're handling them. What practices are lacking? I have to tell you, I saw a young man just a couple of nights ago delivering food in my building and as soon as he walked through the front door into the lobby, he took his mask off. I couldn't believe it. I was like, we're a year into this pandemic. And I don't know too many people who've not been touched by it. We know somebody, we know someone who knows someone from it. Um, or you know somebody who knows somebody. Yes. What is, what is, well, what is missing? What kind of campaign is needed? And if you could walk us through how we wear a mask correctly, wash our hands, Seems very simple, but most of us do not know. So when you mentioned, so it's one of the things like we're told, clean our hands, right? And many don't think that, they don't think about it. They don't think, did I get 20 to 25? Am I washing my hands? Am I cleaning in between? Am I making sure that I'm getting between where the thumb meets the hands? Am I scrubbing my fingers? Am I getting the back part of my hand? So there's often some side of the hands that are missing. And even for those of us that are in healthcare, we know that it takes years and years of practice of doing this just to make sure that we're doing it correctly. Well, a lot of individuals are still not doing it correctly and I'm still observing it, let's say if I'm in a restroom. When you bring up mask wearing, so I, I caution people. So just like now, like how here it is, you know, my shirt, is a little bit low, Dr. Fur Holden, like how it's not low, but I'm exposed. So if I have a mask on correctly and it's supposed to cover my face from here, if I put it up under my chin, and this is after a conversation of us talking to each other directly, let's just say that your mask doesn't protect your droplets from coming out of your mask, but mine's is doing its job. 
The minute I go to lower my mask and sit it down here beneath my chin, the next time that I raise it up, I've now taken a droplet that you've transferred to me. And I'll not, I now have given them access potentially to my nose and my mouth. And we know that COVID travels through the eyes, mouth, and nose. And so I caution individuals that when they wear their mask down here, they're doing it against their safety. So it's not helping. The other piece of it is many don't recognize our cell phones are our third hand. They are with us all the time. We're constantly touching them. That same cell phone that you're touching with your hand, you then have now placed towards your mask or it's resting on your skin. And again, when we think about the proximity of our eyes, mouth, and nose to the germs that we're transferring to our face, that is something that we don't think of. So I think we really missed the mark of not just how to socially distance, practice hand hygiene, um, as well as wear masks, but it's how do we implement these things in our day-to-day lives? Absolutely. Dr. Walks, you have had to oversee a city, a whole city, really a city state, if you will, the District of Columbia as the former head of their public health system. When you hear Dr. Knighton, what do you think? I mean, what can a city, what should a state, what should our nation be doing to to, I mean, a year in to let people know how this is spread, how this is transmitted, and what they should be doing. I'll get to policy in a minute, but I have to get practical first and foremost, because you've overseen a whole public health care system. And as I've shared with you, I have a very dear friend who has recovered from COVID-19. And this person had the highest, the highest regard for how the healthcare system that you oversaw how this person was handled. Uh, This person said, I was called like clockwork the same time every day. They wanted to know the meds that I was taking. They wanted to make sure, and they made sure that I got well. They made sure that I got to my appointments. Please start with the practical. What should a public health department be saying? Well, first of all, let me let me say I wish I could take credit for exactly what's happening now in the District of Columbia. It's good to hear that things are going well there and that the folks in charge, uh, Mayor Mayor Bowser and the uh, health department director are doing a great job. It's, it's, it's good to know that because you can't have a public health department dependent on the person who is there running it. There have to be structures and constructs in place. And both can't just include the health department. One of the advantages of when I ran the health department in DC and what's going on there now is you have strong leadership at the mayoral level and and in DC right now at the deputy mayor level. Uh, Wayne Turnage runs that part of the district government. And it's a wonderful thing to know that it goes across departments. Public health is not just a health department issue. The public schools have to be aware and integrated in what a health department is doing. All of the other departments have to be a part of it. So the first thing you you do is you wanna make sure that your city is being run in an integrated fashion so that people, no matter what part of the city they touch, no matter what part of the state they touch, the message is consistent about what we want folks to do. Let me say this about public health, uh, Santita. Public health is, we a lot of healthcare is about getting people good information. Public health is about getting people to do something. We want you to behave in a certain way. That's typically a public health kind of a message. So everything that our good doctor just said about the mask and the hand washing, critical information to be consistently given across the entire jurisdiction. And then who is the message being given to and how do you identify the people it needs to get to? So linkages across barber shops, linkages across beauty shops, linkages across places where people are. This is why messages have to go out across the district. Um, So in terms of how do you get the message out and how do you make a difference? It has to be an integrated message, the same message, but given to the community it's given that it needs to get to. So for example, um, yesterday was Sunday, where was I? I was in church with the pastor giving a message about COVID to our congregation. 
And I think doctors and nurses and other healthcare people, public health people need to be out of our offices and in our community. I'm always happy to see Dr. McDougall out. I don't know when he's ever home because he's always someplace talking about how health gets into your home and into your habits, mm -hmm. into your habits. That's where public health needs to be. Hmm. What about, as you said, it seems to me, you know, a fully integrated system. I mean, and I, because I have to tell you, I was in college, and I was, I was really struck by the fact that the head of the D.C. Public Health Department was very, very much a part of the community, and that, and that is something that I've seen in Washington that is quite admirable. I think that's why I brought that up because you all have been very consistent in Washington D.C., which has been Chocolate City, which has been a city that up until Marion Barry really did. You had a black. You had a black middle middle class, but you didn't have an entrepreneurial class. I mean, you and you had poor. You had just, just, just unmoving poverty, and that changed under him. And so I'm trying to find out what it is that that DC public health is doing right. What what is it? Because I, I'm telling you, I was struck by this person's experience, and I was so happy to hear that this is a public health department that is doing this that treated me as I felt valued, and I felt that I would get through it because I had one person who called me every day to make sure that I got my meds. Well, you it, it's really hard to wake up and decide to treat people as if they're valued when you don't value them ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the challenges with COVID-19 across our country is that we are seeing that the constructs that we need to have in place aren't in place everywhere. Um, we wouldn't have to talk so much about how to fix our public health system if the public health system was already funded equitably and if it was equitably resourced across not just the funding, but the attention that people get. I could go on and on, and I won't, about inequities in healthcare treatment for people of color, but we, we see that every time we touch, we touch the community, we touch disparity every single time. Mm -hmm. And so a place like DC where you have, it's no, it's no accident that we have an African-American woman, mayor in DC, an African-American woman heading the health department, we have an African-American brother as the deputy mayor, but there's this caring about people who look like us that happens in a place where people run it that look like us. To a large extent, part of that is saying, you know what, I recognize that people that look like me can be anywhere. You mentioned the entrepreneurial class. Mm -hmm. You can walk into DC. You don't know if the person you're looking at works in the building or owns the building. You just don't know. And so there's something about that diversity of accomplishment that helps to get us towards the, uh, Dr. Dr. Deborah's favorite word, I think, equity. I think we have to get to equity and we do it by respecting all of the individuals. I remember walking through DC one time and trying to be incognito, and there was a, 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 a young man sitting on the, on the sidewalk said, Dr. Walks, I see it's you under that hat. <laughs> and it's, it's nice to be in the community where people know you. Why? Because when you come back to help them with information, they'll say, oh yeah, he was here yesterday when he didn't need me to do anything. Now he's back. I think he really understands a little bit about me and what my situation is. Because you know what? I can't worry about COVID-19 if I'm worried because I'm hungry. I can't mm -hmm. worry about COVID-19 if, if I'm about to get evicted this afternoon. And so we have to look in an integrated fashion at our communities and what those communities need all the time so that people can pay attention to that public health message. Hmm. And you know, I'm building to you, Dr. McDougall, because as the head of the National Medical Association, you've been looking at COVID, the coronavirus and COVID-19, this pandemic, but you uh, and Reverend Jackson have come together with Dr. Deborah Furhold, and you have been leading the Rainbow Push Public Health task force and the National Medical Association, the National Bar Association, you crossed disciplines and you came up with a public health manifesto in the midst of this pandemic. Why a public health manifesto and what's in it? Um, thank you, Santita. I'm going to answer that, but I want to pivot 
to the discussion that just happened, we were talking about DC and the higher percentage of blacks living in that community. That being said, let's look at other states that may not have that amount of, of co collaboration, right? So what states have some of the highest, the entire state, the highest percentages of black Americans? Let's talk about Mississippi. Let's talk about Georgia. Let's talk about Florida, Tennessee, Alabama, uh, and the like. And, and what do those southeastern states have in common? All of them have not adopted the Affordable Care Act. So in light of this pandemic, you have some of the states with the highest percentages, South Carolina, I left them out of there, some of the highest percentages of Black people, and yet in the same, have not expanded uh, uh, Medicaid, have not expanded opportunities to have uh, insurance networks that uh, entrepreneurs can buy into. So I think that's a focus that we need to have as a country and our legislature uh, class and folks uh, really pay attention to that. I, we, uh, I wrote an op-ed with uh, Mayor, former Mayor Landrew concerning this issue that was published in The Hill, so that's a reference there. So uh, I'm glad we're speaking to this percentage of Black people in, in a state and how that lack of insurance and coverage can also be a factor in one's health and ability to obtain adequate health care. And so, uh, Reverend Jackson, what I like, so this was about March of 2020, and uh, we met with uh, Reverend Jackson and Reverend Jackson said, we need a 10 point plan. <laughs> he said, we need a manifesto. Dr. Duffer heard and holding that I and you uh, were involved with this process. And uh, it eventually became a 12 point plan that was published uh, on April 15th of 2020, involving a collaboration with the Rainbow Push Coalition, the National Medical Association, and National Bar Association. And quiet as it's kept, those 12 points are still pertinent today and really speak to prevention and uh, the uh, physical distancing and using technology to communicate, especially in uh, places of worship and to really uh, prevent this spread. So uh, it's something that has led to uh, the development of the uh, National Medical Association's uh, task force on uh, COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics and uh, going around and uh, speaking to the pharmaceutical companies about the safety and effectiveness and comparison of cohorts of Black people compared to others. So uh, there's quite a bit going on in news, uh, Santita. You know, when we... I when we get on the other side, I really do want to focus on equity, but I would like in these in these last couple of minutes before we go to break, in about 90 seconds, if you can tell me why, Dr. McDougall, you chose to have a public health manifesto. It seems to me that you wanted to look at public health broadly, not just, it seems like the pandemic has been an opportunity for us to look at the uh, the inequities in the system, not just inequality, but inequities. In about 90 seconds, why public so, health broadly and not COVID-19 specifically? Well, Reverend Jackson came up with that idea of manifesto. I said, oh, that's good, a manifesto. We're going to drop a manifesto on the United <laughs> States of America. And uh, it also includes the fact that we need to increase workforce diversity. We need more Black nurses. We need more black pharmacists. We need more black doctors. We need more black Deborah Fur Holdings. We need public health officials and uh, uh, leaders uh, ha that have uh, spoken with us today. We also uh, reached over the horizon to the continent of Africa and speaking to the United States withdrawal from the World Health Organization and 
uh, needing to be engaged and to, and to ensure that adequate resources were being supplied to the continent of Africa. So it is a broad speaking to the least of these, speaking to incarcerated persons, persons in nursing homes, uh, and the like, and is yes. as a pertinent today. Uh, <laughs> Well, you know, when we get back on the other side of the break, we're going to look at inequities in the system. It seems that COVID-19 has helped us to see it's been a blessing in disguise. Now we have to deal with inequality and more than that, inequities. And how do we get there? How do we get from where we are to where we're supposed to be? Back in just a minute. Since 1999, Push Excel has taken the historically black colleges and universities tour. This tour has exposed over 1,400 students from the Chicagoland area to 65 different colleges and universities and over 20 different cultural sites. This is done so that they have the opportunity to make better decisions about their college experience and choices. So this month, we are continuing on that legacy virtually. We are sponsoring and partnering with organizations that are doing like-minded things and bringing you awesome opportunities in the educational equitable space. On February 13th, join us, the ladies of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Push Excel, the Office of Career and College Services, as well as several different partnering organizations for an HBCU experience, the history, legacy, and future of historically black colleges and university. We invite you to the events, but we also invite you to equip yourselves with the most important information to make the college selection process that is best for you. So go to www.pushexcel.org for more information on the upcoming events and to become a student member of rainbowpush.org. It is only $15 and you want to make sure that you are staying tuned in so that you can continue to push forward. Greetings friends, this is Pastor Joseph Bryant Jr. and I serve as the Executive Director of the Rainbow Push Coalition Silicon Valley Bay Area Office and Push Tech 2020, all of our programs and initiatives that have been launched by the incredible vision of our wonderful legendary leader, Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson. We are so grateful for the privilege of serving uh, here in the Bay Area, Northern California and the West Coast. Uh, we're grateful for the honor of being able to represent all of the wonderful initiatives, programs and things that Reverend Jackson has implemented over the years. Uh, his vision truly is coming to pass in so many different ways and we're excited to be a part of it. We wanna invite you to join us this coming Monday evening, February 15th, for a very special program that we are having called Keep Hope Alive. In the spirit of Reverend Jackson's famous saying that he shares all over the world, keep hope alive, uh, coming out of the 1984 Democratic Convention, those words that resonated so loudly and strongly, uh, they continue to raise the bar of our own hearts and our own inspiration today. Uh, but we have created an initiative known as the Keep Hope Alive Project. During COVID, uh, in this pandemic, uh, Keep Hope Alive has been a program we've been able to put on here in the Bay Area in partnership with the Mayor of San Francisco, Mayor London Breed, city departments and various agencies to ensure that we receive information on how to manage our lives, how to instruct ourselves and our congregations, our communities and our loved ones around COVID. And of course, with the vaccine now being such a relevant topic, we're covering much of that as well. But this coming Monday, we're gonna do something extra special. We're going to honor the wonderful, amazing, tremendous, sacrificial workers, all these wonderful people 
that have been on the front lines, all of these health professionals that have literally just dove into the pool and, and have been right there with us, swimming around, creating uh, ways for us to stay safe and sound and, and, and be able to, to navigate these difficult waters. They have been so much a part of how we have been able to survive now a whole year of this global pandemic. Our frontline health professionals have done so many wonderful things. They have left their homes, they have left their cities, they have gone into these wards and they have been there for COVID patients and their families. And so we're gonna honor them on February 15th. We invite you to uh, go to the Silicon Valley website, which is Rainbow Push SV for Silicon Valley, rainbowpushsv.org and register today. We want you to join us on Monday evening. We're also going to recognize the partnership that we have with the San Francisco African-American Faith-Based Coalition, who has now distributed over 200,000 meals during the pandemic. And so we're gonna celebrate them on that night as well and have some other information we wanna make available to you and to all of our cohorts. And so please join us on February 15th at 6 p.m. Pacific time, 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. We are so grateful for Keep Hope Alive and the platform and the vision that Reverend Jackson has shared with us. In addition, I do wanna just remind you, this is Black History Month. And one of the things that we're doing as an organization is that we're honoring black history that is happening today. And there's a phenomenal company that has been launched here in Silicon Valley through our push tech work, really part of the building of our conference and our engagement with Silicon Valley companies. And I just wanna give a huge shout out and give you a chance to hear from and see this phenomenal woman who has created a company known as Aniva. And this is Anita, Garnier, she's gonna come and share her story of keeping hope alive, of pushing tech and making a difference as she's been used as a woman entrepreneur, African-American of power to do something great under the vision of Reverend Jackson. Watch this. Hi, I'm Anita Darden Gardine. I'm the CEO and co-founder at Oniva. Thanks to Reverend Jesse Jackson and his introduction to Push Tech in 2014, I'm the 11th black female in U.S. history to raise a million dollars, and I'm banking my five million this month. Thanks to Reverend Jackson's introductions to Microsoft, Intel executives, our patented technology platform is thriving and growing. Please allow me to share Oniva Concierge Care with you all. Thanks to Reverend Jackson. The Oniva Concierge Care technology platform delivers trusted, personalized in-home care as an employer-provided benefit. Finding trusted caregivers can be a full-time job. The Oniva Me app makes it so finding caregivers only takes minutes. Watch how easy and convenient finding a quality caregiver with a fingerprint-based living FBI background check can be. Today I need to schedule childcare with driving, I need my Oniva Pro to pick up my daughter at 3.30 from school, drive her to our home, help her find a healthy snack, and get her homework started. The Oniva platform has returned four independent business operators who will come to my door. Oniva only presents caregivers who meet all applicable local and state requirements and who have a living FBI background check. Meaning, if a violation is found, Oniva is notified and the individual is removed from the platform so they're not in anyone's home. Watch May's video and see for yourself what an outstanding Oniva Pro she is. Hello, my name is May and I would love to take care of your family as your Oniva caregiver. My services include driving and child care. I have over eight years of child care experience for both agencies and private homes. I love working with children and enjoy their playfulness and creativity. I look forward to bringing my care to you and your family as your Oniva Pro. I can also see May's current Trustline certification, meaning that Oniva has verified that she has passed and maintains a fingerprint-based living FBI background check. May also has first aid and CPR, and I can see her past experience with two other families all of her personal car and insurance information. I choose May. I add in a note about a healthy snack and that I'd like her to start her homework. I click post bookings and May will get a push notification about this job. See, there's my request. Oniva offers GDPR level data protection and privacy. So May will only be able to see some of my information just enough to let her know if she can meet the request. 
May gets another push notification confirming that she's got the job and now has access to my detailed instructions and locations. Once May is done with this job, all of my private information is withdrawn. In less than three minutes, Oniva found me four FBI background checked caregivers, their references, current certifications, and availability. I'm done booking care for my daughter today, and I can easily get back to work knowing she will be well -being. Thank you so much for allowing me to share Oniva. If you want to learn more about how to join as an enterprise customer or as a caregiver, come find me, the lady in the red dress. Anita at Oniva.com. Thank you, Reverend Jackson. Please, everybody, come join us at Oniva. Hi, my name is Gable Gatherer. I will be presenting a Black history hero by the name of Charles Richard Drew. Charles Richard Drew was an African-American surgeon, educator, researcher, and advocate who discovered that separating plasma from the whole blood and then refrigerating them separately allowed the blood to last longer. Dr. Charles Richard Drew broke barriers in a racially divided America to become one of the most important scientists of the 20th century. His pioneering research and systematic developments in the use and preservation of blood plasma during World War II not only saved thousands of lives, but innovated the nation's blood banking process and standardized procedures for long-term blood preservation and storage techniques adapted by the American Red Cross. As head of the Department of Surgery at Freedman's Hospital, his mission was to train young African-American surgeons who would meet the rigorous standards in any surgical specialty and place them in strategic positions throughout the country where they could, in turn, nurture the tradition of excellence. This, he believed, would be his greatest and most lasting contribution to medicine. And this is the Black History Hero by the name of Dr. Charles Richard Drew. Good morning. We are in the midst of a major drive to get more members, more people engaged and involved in Rainbow Push, uh, supporting the programs of Push for Excellence and the Citizenship Education Fund. If you're interested in public policy and you want to help change the policies that impact those incarcerated, change the policies that impact uh, students attending uh, colleges and universities, if you want to be a policymaker, then you need to join Rainbow Push and join by paying your $35 right now. Some of you watch us every week. You, you listen to us on the radio. You're viewing us on social media. We need you to become a member. It's only $35 a year. If you believe in the scholarships that we give to thousands of students each and every year, we've awarded more than $10 million to scholars year to date. What do you have to do to give and support PUSH? It's really very simple. You can go to rainbowpush.org if you're on a computer and press donate. Give any amount, every dollar is important. If you want to talk to somebody, call us at 773-256-2775. You can give right now, any denomination that you uh, choose. You can text the word PUSH, P-U-S-H, to 41444. Text the word on your cell phone. Most of you have a cell phone. Just text PUSH, P-U-S-H, to 41444, and you can give any amount that you feel comfortable giving or call us 773-256-2775 or go to rainbowpush.org and just press donate. Wherever you are, you can support us as we keep pushing for you. Welcome back to the second half of the Rainbow Push. Let's talk about it with Santita Jackson and friends edition of a candid conversation about COVID. Of course, Dr. Deborah Frolden, we have not heard from you. You said that this is a time for us to really tackle inequities in the healthcare system. Please explain. Yeah, so this is, you know, Dr. Walks sort of made fun of me, but this is my thing. Um, I think what COVID did is, Dr. Walks is my guy. Uh, mm -hmm. What COVID did is it just shined a light on what was already there. Inequity didn't emerge during the COVID pandemic. 
And the reason that I am on a push to mandate equity, and I want to clarify what I mean when I say mandate equity. We learned some valuable things during the beginning of the COVID crisis around how to mitigate disparities in COVID cases and in COVID deaths. We learned very early on that if people were going to have the ability to isolate or to self-quarantine if they had been exposed, that they would need access, barrier-free access to testing. And we saw tremendous uh, barriers for people having access to testing. Initial testing required that you have a primary care uh, a physician or a physician give you a script for a test. Well, if you came into the pandemic and you didn't have a physician, how are you going to get that? And then a lot of the other testing that we created and put out in community to solve that barrier, we created drive-through testing. And very much like a fast food restaurant, you couldn't walk through the site. So if you didn't have a car, you couldn't access that. We created all of these problems that didn't address the real, what I call causes of the causes, which is that we simply live in a world where the playing field is not level, where we have real barriers for people having everything they need to have optimal health and opportunities for optimal access to quality health care. And so my, my position is that we've got a lot of very hardworking, very smart people doing the work. I sit on the New York task force. I hear what they say. I sit on the Michigan task force. I hear what they say. I sit on my local task force. And time and time again, what I'm hearing are the tales of good, strong-willed people, community organizations, federally qualified health centers, nurses, community health workers, pushing a boulder uphill to make sure that we get this vaccine to the people who need it the most and that we do it fairly and equitably. What I say is missing is pull. They're pushing the boulder, but there's no policy in place. There's no mandate that says, states, we used our taxpayers' dollars to pay for what's in that vial. You are now required, if you receive these vaccines, to demonstrate that you can get it, not just distribute it, but into people's arms fairly and equitably. That policy would be the pool. I say, if it matters, we make it a law. We decided at some point that seatbelts save lives. We all take that as a fact. And we have laws. You must wear your seatbelt. If we say equity matters, all I'm asking for is that we have laws that back that, that we have pull from our federal government and our state government to honor the tremendous amount of push that we're seeing out in community. And that is why I am committed that we mandate equity. How does the public health system, what do you do in this moment when we're about to reopen these schools? I mean, that's here. That's that, that train has, it has left the station. Whatever our reservations are, the schools are about to be reopened. What should be done to reopen the schools and what responsibilities um, does, does a city, does a state, does a nation have to these children and to the teachers and to everyone who works in that ecosystem, the bus drivers? So, so, so Santita, let me, let me put one of my other hats on. I spent five years on the uh, Maryland State Board of Education. And the only thing more diverse than public health across the country is education across the country. The Maryland State Board of Education ran like a corporate board, hired and fired the superintendent, all, um, all of the personnel issues came up to the state board. And so you have many boards of education that actually run the education system like a corporate board and are responsible for things like um, approving construction of school buildings, improvements in school buildings, all of that kind of thing. So this is universal in the government. Know where you are, understand how your Department of Public Health works, understand how your Department of Education works, understand who is responsible for what parts of it, because then you know where to apply the pressure. I may kid Dr. Deborah about that word, but that is our word. It is important for us to make sure that there's equity. But how do we get there? I, 
I can spend about a minute celebrating the problem and then I've got to go to next steps. I'm a next steps kind of guy. And what do we do next? What we do next is we understand that there are people who are accountable. One of my other favorite words, who are accountable for what we are living with, for the schools with the icicles and the water fountains that don't work and all of that. And those people respond to the people that vote. We have got to recognize that our way out of all of this in this United States of America is to vote. And we can't just show up when it's time to vote for the president. We have to show up when it's time to vote for the local judge, when it's time to vote for the local sheriff, when it's time to vote for the mayor and the council people. Because at, in different communities, different people are running those different things that impact our health and impact our resources. So I think it's critical for us to realize that there is something we can do. We can find out, hey, who's running? I had a friend that ran for ANC in one of the communities in DC, just because she said, you know what? Nobody's doing anything. Guess what happened when election time came? Nobody else was running. I think she voted, her husband voted and she got the position. She now had influence in her community. That can't happen every day, but every day that you decide to know who's running and you decide to know who's in charge of what's bothering you is a day you have an opportunity to fix whatever is wrong in your community. So let's not get too far away from where the power is. The power is in the vote. Yeah, and the power does rest with us, Dr. McDougall. I mean, it's, that's why you have this public health manifesto. I mean, thank you, Dr. Walsh, because the public really do have to get involved. I mean, I think that oftentimes we have been passive about our health. We go see the doctor, particularly only when we really get sick, but we really are hurting. Many of us don't get the annual checkup, which we should do. Um, but that now is the time for us to really get involved, to really get involved in our health care, to have discussions about um, about not just our public health, but our personal health, our personal health, and our public health. Where do you want us to go? Where do you see us going from here, doctor? Okay, so another good question. So I'm going to take us back to uh, 1968 and Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? And he speaks to the importance of the Black church, the Black press, Black fraternities and sororities, and Black professional organizations. And so that involves coalition building, that involves engaging people who have relationships with people in the community, that's what we've been expanding upon. Uh, the Rainbow Push Coalition, uh, like the listeners to also look at the Black Coalition Against COVID website and the National Medical Association advisory statement on Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. Uh, so we're continuing to grow this coalition to speak the, to the times that we are in today. And uh, I thank you for convening this uh, town hall for Rainbow Push Coalition. And we just need to keep working, keep uh, on that ground game, person to person, having conversations mm -hmm. with people in the community. So I think this is all very important. You know, and I think that you're right. I mean, as we begin to close things out, I do hope um, Dr. Deborah Ferholden, I'm hoping that um, you've been in Flint, Michigan. I mean, you have been living in the midst of um, a city that has challenged you to live in a particular way because you can't you can't really drink the water. I mean, we, I mean, and we have a lot of Flints, Dr. McDougall, Dr. Walks, and Dr. Knight, and all around the country. But it's one thing to hear about it and read about it. It's another thing to to live in it. Um, do you think that's made you, um, do you think that's really, uh, I would say, has that made, has that heightened your activism? I mean, you're, I mean, you take these stellar credentials, all of you, but you've gone into the public space. In living in Flint, what kind of tied this up for us tonight? Living in Flint has changed me in ways that I can only say I'm a better human being 
having been in Flint, when you realize how much brilliant, how much talent, how much heart, how much just extraordinary, you know, talent and ability there is here, the thought that that would be diminished or taken away from them or, you know, um, somehow suppressed because it's a, a city where big business divested or where the governor thought less of us than he did the larger cities like Grand Rapids or East Lansing. It's an honor and a privilege to take the that Hopkins PhD and these NIH grants and all of this fierceness and activism and, and roll it out for these people who are my neighbors and my friends and my colleagues and my partners in the work. If you've never been in a city like Flint, and Flint is not the only Flint, but I, I have to you know, just speak for my people. There are many Dr. Fur Holdens in this city. Some of them are three and four and five years old right now. They deserve the people like me to be fighting and clearing the way for people like them. Because guess what? Somebody did it for me. I am because you are. I am because of Reverend Jackson. I am because of a Dr. McDougal. So this is just to me paying it forward. And it is one of the most profound honors and privileges that I have to use my time, my talents, my treasures to stand with and fight for my people. You know what? And I think that really wraps it up for us because Flint is really the United States of America, which is the world. Uh, Flint helps us to look at the how we really have to function as neighbors, as one, uh, not just individually, but corporately. What responsibilities do we as individuals have, we as communities? What responsibilities do corporations have with all of us? All of these things are inter interconnected, and we've seen in Flint what happens when things don't go right. But you know what, we hope this conversation will help you to think about what can happen when things go right, when things go well. What can you do? You can do a whole lot. Dr. Waltz, you're right. You can vote about it. In fact, you must vote about it. The reason we're beginning to see some change now is because that is what you did in November. And that is what you did in January. You must continue. That's the end of the beginning, not the beginning of the end. You've got to vote. You've got to take care of yourself. You've got to make an educated decision about the vaccine, a, a, a decision that is not based in fear, but that is based in your empowerment, your healthfulness, your knowledge, and as Dr. Deb would say, doing the work. Take the time, it's your health. You need to find out everything that you can find out. But the beautiful thing about seeing you, Dr. Knighton, and seeing you, Dr. McDougall, and seeing you, Dr. Walks, and seeing you, Dr. Deborah Ferholzen, is that you look like some child who thinks that what you've done is unattainable. And it's not. I think of Dr. Andrew Thomas. Many of us don't know him, but we should. He headed up something called Project 75. And Project 75, he was a Howardite. And he went to Howard's Medical School because after graduating with high honors from the University of Chicago, they would not let him into their medical school. But he never forgot being shut out with all of his brilliance. And he created a, pro a Project 75. And this project got more Black people into and through medical school than at any time in our history. Incredible. There's so much that we can do. There's so much that we need to do. And we do hope that you will join the Rainbow Push Coalition. Join the Rainbow Push Coalition. We need your support. We need your help. We need you to follow us on Twitter and follow us on, on social media. But we need you to support us. We're giving away pampers, we're giving away food, we're giving away meals because people are in need. We're able to contact and work with a Dr. McDougall and a Dr. Walks and a Dr. Knight and a Dr. Deborah Verholden because of your support. We must remember, today we celebrate and recognize those giants in their respective fields who this month gained their wings yet will be indelibly etched fittingly into the celestial sphere of black history excellence and escalation. 
we recall the gifts of legendary Temple University and first black basketball coach in Philadelphia's Big Five, John Chaney. He led Temple to 17 NCAA tournaments, amassing 741 wins as a college coach. He largely recruited players from poor neighborhoods who were overlooked by the game's national scouts. We remember stalwart, fearless, and unrelenting Chicago Teachers Union President Karen Lewis. With a tough mind and a tender heart, she procured the best resources and the highest quality of education for children. We remember and revere this powerful advocate and mold breaker who led and transformed a movement. Where did our love go? We reflect upon the life of a love supreme and iconic lady of Motown, Miss Mary Wilson, who not only became a member of one of the most popular trend-setting groups in history, breaking social, racial, and gender barriers, but a best-selling author, businesswoman, and cultural ambassador. Rest in power and in peace. The dreams of African Americans are unfolding in remarkable ways in the 21st century. This is a generation that has come up recognizing that the country is broken. Voices of the movement. Dr. Kim, I went to jail with a group of seven students, July 17th, 1960, almost 60 years ago. We never stopped moving. I lost a few jail cells and death, we never stopped moving. I thought it was time to write some of it down so the only generation can learn how we did, what we did, and how global it was. Whether it's speaking about Mandela in South Africa, uh, India, Qatar, about Gandhi in India, uh, here at home. This book tells the story, so please get it to give it to your friends. Read it, let's, let's argue about it, let's discuss it. Yep, so the book is Keeping Hope Alive, Sermons and Speeches of Reverend Jesse Jackson um, Sr. It's, it's quite a good collection. You know, we've got sermons and speeches from around the globe because you have made such a global impact, not just here in the U.S., but around the world. Thank you for tuning in to our International Saturday Morning Broadcast. We need your support. Here are ways to give to Rainbow Push Coalition. Text PUSH, P-U-S-H, to 41444 to support the work of Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr. and Rainbow Push Coalition. When you shop, Amazon gives. Visit Amazon Smile and select PUSH for excellence as your charitable organization by starting your shopping at smile.amazon.com. Get involved with the movement. Join the movement. If you're not a member, become a member. I am somebody. Fighting the most important battles for freedom and justice for all. You made us change. Oh, try to bring closer. Join Rainbow Push. But you're not pushing me away. Join, Join the movement. movement.